All right, you're welcome along to Team 33. I'm Andy Call, and tonight we're going to be talking about an impossible job, the Graham Taylor story of the ill-fated England 1994 World Cup qualification. And to discuss that, Colin Buick, Paul Moore and Kieran Bradley are on the line with me. Lads, how are you getting on? Oh, yep. Not too bad. Good, man. So before we get started on this, we, we talked about Mike Bassett, football manager, a couple of weeks ago as we we're reviewing our football films. We're going into football documentaries now over the next couple of weeks, and this is the obvious starting point because Mike Bassett was a mockumentary of this flying wall documentary. I just want to say from the start off, Mike Bassett was unbelievably accurate when it came to depicting this. Like, how they portrayed Graham Taylor was so spot on if not a little bit mean, because Graham Taylor comes across brilliantly in this. Colm, I'll let you have the first words. What did you think of, firstly, how Graham Taylor comes across in this, and is he fairly treated by the English fans? No, but you're never going to be treated fairly by the English fans, and especially at that time when the tabloid press were so harsh and the media's influence was so significant and prevalent um, that they had such a big say over what the the country thought about England and England manager. And Graham Taylor's weakness was probably in his strength in that just before we started recording, you and I ended up were saying that he just comes across as such a genuinely lovely guy who probably not even cared too much because they probably all care too much if they got to that level in the game, but he showed that he cared too much. And the comparisons with Mike Bassett, England manager, um, are so valid, like especially having rewatched this documentary last night. And there are there are moments which they're exactly the same, the cuts from the movie to the real life documentary. There's one where uh, England have won. I think it's the three nil victory over Poland um, the towards the end the, of the campaign. At the door of the dressing room. The door in the dressing yeah. room, yeah. And he's waiting for the players to come, and that's exactly what happens to Mike Bassett. But even more so, they have the double header in summer of 1993 away to Poland and Norway. And in a press conference before that, uh, Graham Taylor says, uh, he's asked, can they beat? Can they, can they get the six points here? Can they beat both sides? And he says, uh, I'm a realist. You can't predict this. Which is exactly what Mike Bassett says in that press conference that we were talking about when we were talking about Mike Bassett, England manager, when he says, like, well, obviously I want to win, but I don't know if we can. I mean, I can't predict the future. And I think that's pretty much what Graham Taylor was saying, but he said it in a much more uh, believable and professional manner. And I do feel like he was hardly treated. I mean, his win ratio, it isn't appalling. It's, it's 47.4% from 38 games. And to compare that to his predecessors, like Bobby Robson was 49.5%. And Terry Venables took over from Graham Taylor, and his win percentage is 47.8%. But because uh, both Robson and Venables got England to major tournament semi-finals, obviously their tenure is much better remembered than Taylor's, who uh, got a point, two points from three games in Euro 92, uh, two nil all draws and a 2-1 defeat to Sweden, and failed to qualify for USA 94. Yeah, so, and that's really what happened. So going into this documentary, it's England's qualification run for the World Cup in 1994 in USA. Their, their group stage includes Norway, Netherlands, Poland, Turkey, San Marino. A fairly winnable group or a qualifiable group anyway, but you have to take into account that Netherlands were a force at this point. Kieran, firstly, before we get into the nitty-gritty of the documentary, Graham Taylor, uh, too nice of a guy? Um, I don't know. Uh, he's... Uh, an absolute gentleman, and I have to say from the outset that this has always been probably my favourite football documentary of all of them. Um, I think that in terms of giving an understanding of what not only a manager's job, but the England manager's job in the round, like the the training, the, the man management, the managing up uh, with the FA board, the, the fans, everything like that, it's absolutely superb. So... I mean, it's it's difficult to judge Taylor's managerial style on the England job. I don't think it's the ideal acid test for um, for a manager. Like, if you look at, say, what he did with Watford, where he is revered. I mean, there's a stand named after him, and he is he's godlike, and that that's very close to me at home. So there's a lot of Watford fans that are absolutely in awe 
of what Taylor achieved. Um, I think, in a way, we shouldn't... You can never be too nice a person, actually, I don't think, like, to be, to be, without being too bleeding-heart liberal about it. You really can't. Like, if you look at the way he conducted himself, particularly around um, the John Barnes situation, which I'm sure we'll get on to uh, at some stage, he was an absolute gentleman um, and someone who went into bat for people who weren't were having indecency thrown at them, and he's a thoroughly decent man. And I, I, I think, no, me, you know, maybe he was too nice for the job, but then maybe that says more about the job than it does about um, about Taylor himself. Without revealing what age you are, what age were you for the 1994 World Cup qualifications? Is this something you remember? Uh, not especially well, but I was seven-ish, so about seven in 1993. Um, no, I, I do remember uh, Taylor's name being a byword for kind of mockery and a, and a bit of a joke, which, you know, that perseveres until really you're you're old enough to kind of care and to look into it. And um, that says a lot, I think, about the concentration of, of the media at that stage and something that I think we've got used to over the years is that kind of diversification of media, but the, the, the tabloid press were disgusting towards him and, and that filtered down even to kids, you know. Paul, early thoughts on Graham Taylor? Yeah, I thought it was fascinating watching again. You mentioned there that a documentary doesn't define his managerial career, just like one campaign doesn't define a manager's career. I mean, as you mentioned, Taylor took Watford from the fourth division to an FA Cup final. He took Villa from the second tier into a very competitive team in the first division. I think they finished second so he laid the foundations for that very strong Villa team in the early years of the Premier League. And I mean, even in his England tenure, in his first 23 games, he only lost one, which was to Germany at Wembley, which is, it's not a catastrophe. And Euro 92, OK, they finished bottom of the group with France, Sweden and Denmark, who went on to win it. But I think that, that was the point going into the USA 94 campaign, because England um, didn't achieve anything close to their capabilities in Euro 92 that the Nies were already out. But... Again, you do mention the fact he was he was a very decent man. I mean, during his time at Aston Villa, uh, he was the one manager that really took Paul McGrath's side, the humane side to him. But there, this documentary is a lovely kind of uh, mixing of managerial mistakes, which we'll get to later. Like, he was very tactically naive against Norway, uh, putting his faith in players who were clearly not fit or sharp at the time, Paul Gascoigne and poor Des Walker, who just uh, had a horrible slump in his career at that period for England. There's also some horrible bad luck in here. We, we'll, we'll discuss Ronald Koeman's uh, in, 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 uh, involvement in Rotterdam. There was suspensions to Paul Ince when they went away to Norway, a key player. So a lot of, uh, and even uh, I think it was Gaza was suspended for the game in Rotterdam. So it, it's a lovely little microcosm of, of just a witch's brew of bad luck, bad management as well. And also like the goal Norway scored in the opening game in Wembley by Rechtel, that is an absolute peach. You can't defend against that. And, that's, and as you said before, Norway and Holland were no mugs. I mean, Ireland know that because we played them in the 94 World Cup. This Norwegian team, you've got Gunnar Halle, Ivan Leonardson, Stinging and Bjornaby, Lars Bohinen, Jan Angie Fjortoft. These were all season Premier League players. And as for the Dutch, you've got the De Boers, Koeman, Overmars, Reichardt, Bergkamp, Danny Blind, Ruud Hullet. I mean, this was a tough group getting out of beforehand. But as I said, I think a lot of the damage was done prior to the campaign even starting because uh, Taylor was critical. He was even criticised before he took the job because he never won a major trophy. Um, they, they said he was tactically naive. He was a he was an advocate of the long ball system. So he was fighting battles before he even got in. But stuff like that, and then we have his choice of assistance we'll discuss later. Um, you know, and, and there's also a bit of comedy in this as well, let's face it. Like, yeah, when you've Gaza and Carlton Palmer, if you, it is a lovely microcosm of what I would imagine can go wrong in management through through your own mistakes and also just through sheer horrible luck and coincidence. Yeah, so it was actually Graham Taylor that granted permission for the cameras to follow him around and as well they w must have needed the permission of the FA as well. But if you look at more recent football documentaries, flying the wall documentaries, the, the Man City one springs to mind, the Juventus one that was on Netflix as well, they're polished up marketing tools. They're not really uh, sort of step back a bit from it it's actually the clubs that are putting these things together and they're very very much heavily edited and used as a marketing tool as opposed to actually just being a piece of journalistic work and that's what stands out to me for about this is that 
it, it is exactly as you expect. It is a fly in the wall documentary. You're watching these people go on with their daily lives the way that they normally would. By far and away, the star for me in this is Gaza. And Colm, I know you're a big fan of Gaza. His personality in this, I don't think we'll ever see a footballer like him again in terms of personality. And just the little nitbits you get off him and why people loved him so much as a player and a person is really shown in this film. Yeah, because he's just so intensely vulnerable. And he would have been quite young as well <clears throat> during the filming of this documentary because obviously he was associated with being this kind, this guy who's retired now and is struggling to cope with life. But back then he's in his prime and he, when the documentary starts, he's um, he's just joined Lazio and in Serie A was the strongest league in the world back then and he's playing for one of the better sides in it. Um, so he's at probably his... Um, well, career-wise on the CV, he's at a zenith and his, probably his peak was a year earlier before the FA Cup final injury in 1991. But he's still a fabulous player and you see that, but you see just how intensely loved he was by the rest of the squad when they have the fly-in-the-wall camera for uh, one of the dinners that the the players are enjoying. And you see, I think he's sitting with Ian Wright and Paul Ince and Nigel Martin. Um, and they're all just on, in awe of him and they're staring at him and whatever he's saying, they're laughing at. And it's on the bus too. He's sitting next to Ian Wright. And behind them is Paul Ince and Martin Keown. They're just hanging on every word he says. And he's not even saying anything in particularly insightful or anything like that. It's just that he... Um, he had this charisma, I guess, and also it helps that he was this generational, fabulous player. And I guess his vulnerability and his passion and drive for England to do well and for it to be such a monumental disaster with his jaw being broken uh, and then his really poor display away to Norway in, that, uh, in the game that was in Adir, the 2-0 defeat away to Norway, kind of encapsulates the whole documentary for me. So if there was uh, an Oscar for best lead actor in the documentary it would go to Gaza yeah yeah there's a line even in that game in about in the preparation which I think kind of defines Gaza and how he impacted Taylor Taylor actually says Gaza has to play because Norway players are in all of them yeah and he clearly yeah. wasn't firing all cylinders yeah. we mentioned the fact that Lazio are, are, are demanding a lot for him he's taking time to settle in but like that shows either the naivety of Taylor and that he's kind of buying into the myth of Gaza and can't see the form of the player he has under his nose or he's just, it's, 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 it's the one moment I actually think Taylor borderlines David Brent territory in what is a fairly fair and I think a fairly decent reflection of the man, but that's the one bit I can't fathom for, for well, well, money. He well, says, well, Graham, sorry, uh, Graham Taylor uh, and with Phil Neal and Larry McMenemy, who he puts so much emphasis on, he, he respects them so much and you wonder why. Um, but he's constantly asking them throughout that Norway match, will we take him off? But they, he's so reluctant to take him off because he knows what the press will say if he does. And their discussion borders on that. It's like, well, will we take him off? We can't really take him off. But he's playing terrible. And I then think, they cut him I think as well. Sorry. First man. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, and so, sorry, I didn't mean to cut across. The, the, I, I think with the, the thing with Gaza is that at that point, Taylor, you can argue, w made a tactical mistake in not recognising his form. But at the same time, he's one of these type of players that if... Um, if a team is preoccupied with that player, then it frees up another player because they're likely to double mark him. So there's there's that little there's that little gentle kind of dance you have to do as a manager. And I think actually, yeah, Colin, again, apologies for cutting across, but that point about McMenamy and Neil is really prescient, I think, for the whole thing. I think that Taylor was such a nice man in the respect that he wanted everyone's kind of opinion and takes on things, that it was too much of, there was too much kind of, you know, referral and referendum going on, like that he should have just said, right, okay, well, I'm going to gonna take this particular course of action and, and go with it, whether that be with Gaza or anyone else. Yeah, so in, in the build-up to that, the line that, Paul, you refer to, he says, I don't care if Gaza is 13 stone or 10 stone. When he goes onto that pitch, the Norway players are going to be in on him. And in a way, you can kind of buy into it because he is one of the best players in the planet at that stage. And sometimes just having those players on the pitch can actually spook opposition that way and I suppose we're looking at this from a modern perspective where this would never happen because the game is so tactically uh, built around systems and one weak link in that system the whole thing falls apart whereas this in 1994 the, the, f the football tactics weren't as developed at that stage so I think you still could have gotten away with having the likes of Gaza as a passenger in these games 
And when you look at their their sort of backups for that, the likes of Lee Sharp, Darren Anderton, David Batty, Paul Merson, none of these players compared to what Gaza was. Yeah, it's interesting as well. But like later on, you see how Taylor was, I wouldn't say ruthless, but um, in how he handled the captaincy issue with David Platt. And Platt was, uh, in Sampdoria time, Platt was a big, big player at the time. Um, I mean, he rescued England in, in the World Cup, you remember, with that famous goal. Um, and then he kind of just ruthlessly stripped the captaincy of him. So he was, he, so it was, it was interesting how he handled Platt and Gascoigne in comparison. And, uh, and in, a, in a weird kind of twist of fate, that the cap, he gave the captaincy to Stuart Pearce and the documentary ends with Stuart Pearce's mistake against San, uh, against San Marino. I know England obviously won the game. But it, 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 it's, it's obvious in the sense that throughout his career, Gascoigne has to be managed differently by different player by different managers and we've always known that I mean Bobby Robson always got the best out of him but I I don't know if Taylor ever really I think I think he was more uh, concerned with the ego and the aura of Gaza as a player himself rather than actually just looking at what was under his nose he clearly wasn't fit bar maybe the Turkey game I think he the 4-0 win at home to Turkey he was he was on song but um I think it was maybe a bit naivety on Taylor's part um which I think kind of backfired in the end, but uh, I'm curious to see what the lads' take on it is. Yeah, so let's talk about the way that Graham Taylor handled each player because there are a lot of star players in this team. David Platt is, uh, is one of the highest examples of this. He's the captain, and Graham Taylor flies to Spain to meet him to tell him that Stuart Pearce is coming back into the squad and that he's making him captain. The way that he handles that situation, the way that he handles Gaza, and Kieran, you mentioned earlier on the way that he handled John Barnes and the racist abuse that he was getting, the likes of um, Ian Wright coming into the squad as a sort of squad player, but he's almost good enough at this stage to be starting for England. What do we make of his man management skills? We'll start with the John Barnes situation. So basically what happens is he's being racially abused by his own fans during a game, and he tur Graham Taylor turns to the fans and says, this guy is a human being, would just cop on, treat him that way. No human being should be treated this way. So he clearly has a real warmth about him as a character and the way that he treats each individual player. Yeah, there's, there's basically an even-handedness, I think, with Taylor that um, is very, very... Um, is lovely to see. Like, for example, if you were to hear someone being abused racially or otherwise, like in, in the street or wherever it was, you'd be liable to completely lose your rag or, or blow your top. And, his decency is such that not only is he um, trying to defend Barnes, but he's also speaking to the other person who's hurting this abuse as a human being and trying to appeal to his human, human side too. So I think that's really, um, you know, in, in Taylor's favour. And I think that the whole, the whole way through, that really punctuates the, uh, the documentary in that Taylor would be well within his rights after certain results to, to try and ban the, the cameras from coming into the dressing room or, or following him around afterwards, and he doesn't do that. Like, he, he realises that there's a kind of contract been made, uh, you know, a, a non-binding contract, if you like, between him and, and the, the camera crew, and he lets them in from the beginning. Um, and I think the Platt one in particular was um, really deftly handled, um, you know, I think you also wanted a little bit of a jolly up in the sunshine as well, going down to, I think, yeah, they were in uh, Palmer at that stage. But um, he went over there, he explained, he spoke to him with um, a, a real warmth and understanding um, and, you know, praised what he'd done. But he just said, look, this is the road that we're looking to go and I hope things are all right with us. And, you know, my door's always open. So I was, I've always been extremely impressed by Taylor's uh, fundamental decency. Colin, what do you think of the way that he manages each player? First of all, as a human being, which is something that, first of all, he doesn't have to do as the England football manager, especially at that time when there was such immense pressure on him and he had such a disastrous Euro 92 campaign as the manager. Didn't he take off Gary Lineker in one of the nil-all games too, which was something that England managers just didn't do? Yeah. Um, so he didn't have to be that nice, but as Kieran mentioned with the David Platt scenario, He's just so lovely in that scene. Um, and maybe, like, you know, you could argue, okay, we're overplaying how lovely he was. But there, there's two things there. First of all, again, re uh, referring to what Kieran said earlier, is that I also agree that you can't, there's no such thing as being too nice. That's just not true. It's the word, like, that would be more the world's fault than the person. And secondly, um, Taylor is so uncomfortable staying at the plat. 
because he's trying to make these jokes about we go over there and play football with the kids. And yeah. he just really, really doesn't want to break this guy's heart. And Platt plays the role excellently because he could have been very awkward about it and maybe would have been entitled to because it's a very, very awkward situation to be in. But Platt plays along with it too. And both just come across really well from the scene. So you can't... You could, I would imagine it's very hard for players to criticise what he was like as a man. But tactically, they were very critical of him. And I know that because uh, I read Paul Merson's autobiography, How Not to Be a Professional Footballer, that was released in 2011. And there's two chapters dedicated to his England career, which wasn't what it should have been, really. Um, he is scathing of Taylor as a manager. He said he was tactically all over the shop. Um, he was obsessed with the most minor of details about the opposition. So, for instance, according to Merson, they used to watch hours of video of the opposition taking throw-ins. And Taylor's idea was that when the opposition takes a throw, they're vulnerable because they only have 10 players on the pitch. And that is when we need to attack the opposition, when they're most vulnerable and we have a man extra. And Merce kind of comes back to himself in the book and says, yeah, they have 10 men on the pitch for all of one second. What's that going to do? And I found it interesting that during the documentary, uh, it's the Poland game away where they draw one all and Ian Wright scores the goal. And they're all quite um, downbeat in the dressing room. Afterwards, Paul Lynch is kind of staring into the distance and they know it's not going too well. And then suddenly you hear this, um, this loud noise entering the dressing room. And it's Paul Merson and Nigel Winterburn. And they're delighted for Ian Wright. But they don't even read the room. They don't read how disappointed everyone is. And Taylor turns around and sees that it's Merson and turns back again. And Merson's going over and he's delighted for Wright. He's like, I can't believe you scored. And Wright was like, where were you? I was all up in the stand looking down at you. It's amazing. But it was like he was a family member, not a member of the squad. But Merson wasn't on the bench that night. And this was spring 93, when Merson was probably really going off the rails. And you kind of see that in the documentary as well, that this guy is not, his head is not where it should be. And you can see that he doesn't really have that much time for Taylor. And there's another team talk that Taylor does when it's lashing down with the rain and they're in a little dugout. And Taylor talks yeah. about how people complain about set pieces, about how it's not a cool thing to do and it's not very modern. But he said, well, frankly, I think it works very well, so I don't see why we should stop doing it. And you can see the players kind of looking around being, this isn't very inspiring. Yeah. So that's the two sides of it. Well, there's arguments to be made that Taylor was way ahead of his time here when it came to those little minutiae. Yeah. Because if you look at, say, the training session before the polling game where they're practicing crosses and he's specifically saying that this polling side are vulnerable when it comes to crosses and it's actually a cross where they actually get the goal. When you look at that Ian Wright situation, when he, his goal that he scored, the, you, you, the camera essentially is on Taylor and his backroom staff for the entire game. You don't see much match footage at all. But he's saying to Phil Neal, this game's made for Wrighty to come on and score the winner. And that's exactly what happened. So he clearly has an eye for the game, as well as being this sort of figure uh, that people might say that he's tactically, tactically naive, but he clearly has an eye for the game as well. Karen, I know you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I mean, it was just... I mean, the point about Merson was that there's so much to it. Um, and, like, so, for example, you're not necessarily defending everything that Taylor does... Um, by going into bat for him. But say, the way that Paul Merson looks at the game now, in the kind of fundamentals, and the amount of times that he is fundamentally wrong about things, it just, it pisses me off a little bit, because it's like, if that dressing room had actually left themselves open to a few more new ideas, and maybe a little bit of difference or something like that, something like the ball being dead and people switching off, is exactly what happened at Anfield with Barcelona, not, you know, just over a year ago. This is the kind of stuff, these are the kind of aggregated marginal gains that actually improve uh, a side and they need to be open to it. Like, it, it, it's just so, it's so typical of England at that point where it's a little bit of a boys club and everyone was like, oh no, you're not, you're not the manager who's going to let us go and have the chips and the beer or whatever it is. And it, it just, it kind of frustrates me because it, I think it typified England at that stage and Merson's probably... He's, he's the worst offender for that kind of thing. So, I mean, as you say, end of there as well, like the, the right situation, look, all of this stuff you can view with kind of confirmation bias because it happened like he was there for a right with a load of other stuff. So that's dangerous. But I think that had England just left themselves open and um, to, to a few new ideas um, 
and maybe there weren't new ideas, frankly. Like there might have been old old school or whatever. But you know what? He's managed to go with it. Like just open yourself up. It might have might have turned out a little bit differently, but who knows? Yeah, yeah. There's an example of that. Taylor's last instruction when they're away to Poland is don't get caught in the break. Poland like to play in the break. And England in that in the footage you see are ragged. You could drive a truck through mm-hmm. between the gap between their back four and their midfield. And Poland's goal and they've a near chance comes from. England players about 40 yards up midfield away from their back four. So it, it, you can say Taylor was naive, and he was. We'll get to the Norway game. Three at the back was madness without playing that system. But there's also is a massive degree of blame has to be shifted on the players. I mean, Gaza gets himself suspended for the last game. Ince gets himself suspended for Norway. I mean, it, as Shearer's I said, it, 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 Alan Shearer is injured. I mean, it's a Molotov cocktail of bad management, uh, players not taking responsibility, bad luck, worldy goals, bad refereeing decisions. There's a little bit of everything in here. So I think it's um, it, it's a bit naive to just maybe single one person or one group of players on. But um, no, I 100% take your point in terms of uh, in terms of how he dealt with the players. And I mean, even in the dugout scene Colin was talking about, the players look like they're doing trigonometry on a nine o'clock class on Monday. They just do not want to be there. They're bored out of their mind. And that's on them if they're not taking on instructions from their manager. I mean, they're supposed to be professionals, so... Um, I think both sides can be equally guilty. And actually, Jurgen Klopp took on a lot of what uh, Taylor was talking about uh, all these years later because um, Klopp realised that at set pieces, the Liverpool weren't that proficient when he joined and he worked on them. And they're extremely productive at set pieces now in terms of defending and scoring. And also, he hired a throw in coach, as Taylor was talking about. So that is the other side of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one thing it's sorry, just one final thing. I would say the, the general intelligence of the average player now is so notably different to what it was 30 years ago. Like, it's unbelievable. Like, as you say, that scene in the dugout is like a load of school kids not wanting to pay attention. Now, if you contrast that with, like, Raheem Sterling or whoever it might be who takes on instruction unbelievably well, it's just a, it's, it's miles apart from what it was. Yeah, it's just the evolution of football. We will talk about England's run in this qualification run and some of the mistakes that Graham Taylor made as well. But we do have to take a short break, so we'll take a quick break. Coming up after the break, we'll talk about England's squad and their run in this qualification. All right, welcome back to Team 33 and a call here with you. And I'm joined on the line by Colin Buig, Paul Moore and Karen Bradley as we discuss an impossible job, the Fly in the Wall documentary made about Graham Taylor's ill-fated England qualification for the 1994 World Cup in USA. So before the break, we talked about all the stuff that was good about Graham Taylor, his man management skills, whether or not that he was actually ahead of his time when it came to some things tactically. Some of the mistakes that he made in this are notable and we do have to talk about that. Firstly, going into this qualification, their World Cup run, their group stage was Norway, Netherlands, Poland, Turkey, San Marino. Netherlands had a really good squad, as did Norway, but you would expect England to come through it as well. Their squad included players like David Seaman, Stuart Pearce, Gally Pallister, Tony Adams, Lee Dixon, Graham Lesseau, Martin Keown was their defensive line, David Platt, Paul Ince, Lee Sharp, David Batty, Paul Merson, Carlton Palmer, John Barnes made up the midfield as long as well as Gaza, and Alan Shear, Les Fernandand, Ian Wright, and Peter Beardsley were the forward lines that they had. So it's a pretty good squad, but it's definitely not one of the best that England have ever had. Obviously, you have the Arsenal influence with that that great Arsenal defence, as well as Ian Wright coming through the ranks as well. So the run they have. The results aren't that bad until you get to the Norway and Netherlands games. They're the games you're expected to win, and that's ultimately where they fell down. Colin? Um, yeah, they, yeah, it really wasn't that bad. You look at it, they, as Paul already spoke about, the first game, the first qualifier for the 94 World Cup is the Norway game at home, and that was the rectal um, stupendous goal for Norway, which came against run a play completely and then they hammer Turkey and they hammer San Marino and they beat Turkey away so it's all going really well and they're 2-0 up against the Netherlands wasn't it so yeah. um, they're flying and then um, the Netherlands do what they do they equalise and a kind of like, there's just little moments here and there like the, the Poland game away we've already discussed and then it's the Norway match and then they're extremely unlucky away to the Netherlands so if you look at it objectively, if you just stand away and look at the results, which are actually in front of me right here, it's not terrible. It's by no means an embarrassment. It's just, it's a bit like 
nor near as catastrophic, but it's a bit like Steve Staunton's reign as a Republic of Ireland manager. If you look at Staunton's reign on paper, it's not great, but it's definitely not like documentary bad where you're going to do a whole documentary about how terrible the results were. It's just that when you put the results into context and you lived through them, there's awful moments. And the thing with Staunton in comparison to any other Ireland manager of the modern era was that he had no one standout positive moment, unlike everyone else. Whereas, uh, and that's the same, sorry, as Taylor compared to the managers around him, that he had none, not one moment where you look back fondly as an England fan, I imagine, and think, well, that was a great night, or that was a fantastic result. It was a lot of, yeah, we should be winning those games. That was a decent result away, but ultimately the Norway match and ultimately the two Dutch matches. And that's what people remember about him. So, Paul, I know you wanted to talk about that Norway game, the three at the back. Ultimately, yeah. this is where it starts to go wrong for, for Taylor. It really is. And even before you get into formation talk, um, like Des Walker was brought up in one of the clips in the press say that they bring it to Taylor's attention that his form hasn't been good and you know he's had a bit of a dip. And you can call this either loyalty to players who served you over the years or just a blind spot or just bad management. Maybe if Neil or McMenemy were stronger, they would actually pull Taylor aside and say, here, listen, Des is going through a bit of a bad spell. I mean, he was kind of a fall for the goal in Poland. He gave a graveyard pass into the middle to John Barnes. Poland broke and scored. But in the in the, in the the Norway game, he gets turned inside out for uh, one of the, the first goal. I think it is the, the, finish, the finish in the near post past Chris Woods. But, I mean, they were always asking, the press were always asking Taylor to be a bit more adventurous. And I think this is... Um, either naivety, maybe a small bit of, I wouldn't say arrogance, but maybe a bit of naivety in that he thought that they could go and brush aside Norway and treat them kind of like like fodder uh, and be open and adventurous. And, you know, you were talking about tactics, but if you're playing as a back four as a central defender, uh, if you're familiar with playing in that system, it's very, you can't just switch it on, uh, particularly at international level. And as I said before, Norway, were there were no mugs. I mean, they had, they had a very good side and they went to Wembley got a draw I just think this was this was the, the lowest point and Taylor even admits himself he was underprepared for that game I mean this is this is the real black mark against them I'll accept the defeat in Rotterdam we'll get on to later but it was naive it was foolish and probably a bit, a bit stubborn on his part to, to pick the likes of Walker uh, in that game um, and England even the tactics I know you can edit documentaries and leave stuff out it's an awful lot of ball to the fullback, ping it long. And Taylor even gets upset when the ball doesn't go early long. Like If that was me, I'd be more concerned of why is your fullback giving possession away so cheaply away from home in international. Uh, and even then, he's, he kind of, they had this little montage when he's slow to, to make substitutions. He's contemplating bringing right on. He's kind of will, I want to. I think it's Nigel Clough as well. He's, he's unsure about which one to go for. To me, that was kind of the microcosm of, of, of the faults of Taylor and also the team around him who seemed a bit rabid in the headlights and just a bit out of their depth at this level. Yeah, I think that's my favourite part about this entire thing, though, is that he, Taylor is so animated that he almost thinks every decision out loud. So you get such a clear insight of what he, what's going through his mind because he's, he's literally talking out loud about what he's thinking. And you, you get a good uh, insight into the background team when you, when you have Phil Neal... That, that exact scene where the ball isn't going long quick enough and then the likes of Shearer and I think it was, uh, who was the second? Les Ferdinand was the second yeah. striker up front that day. So what's basically happening is every time Shearer and Ferdinand come short, the ball is played long over the top and they're not making the run. And Phil Neal says, yeah, it's the, uh, it's the chicken and the egg, isn't it? Every time they come for the ball, they, they're not getting it. And every time they make a run that the ball's not there. So it's, it's such a bizarre situation that they didn't really have a fallback, and that's ultimately where the tactics were lacking. So the Netherlands game, let's face it, that was, that, was, that was awful refereeing, like really, really bad refereeing, and that is as unfortunate as you get. Ronald Koeman should have been off that pitch. Karen, Like, yeah, but 100%. 100%. Yeah, you're the England fan here, so I, I know you're passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Koeman should not Yeah, have I mean, it was, it was one of the great, one of the great injustices that England actually have, uh, uh, you know, justifiably um, to talk about. Yeah, I mean, it was ridiculous. He, he should have gone, and it was the. See, it, to come back to Colm's point there earlier about um, the moments, like Taylor 
Taylor had some of the worst moments in living memory for England fans of a certain era, like the the San Marino goal at home, the um, the Koeman free kick, and the the general losing it on the touchline, which is obviously as a result of his documentary as well. Um, but yeah, it was it was um, like I, I, ultimately you can't really you can't really argue with the result like Netherlands were by far the better side England were very jumbled as Paul said like tactically and you know I know I went into bat earlier for, for Taylor but you have to tailor your no, no pun intended tailor your tactics to, to the team that you have and that's you know that's really important and they didn't do it and England weren't good enough over the course of their qualifying group but um, yeah nonetheless uh, they will they will absolutely revel in the fact that Koeman should have been off and still hold it against him 30 years later yeah, he, he definitely should have been off. And also, it was the exact same thing that happened in the box whereby the Netherlands defender blocked it and he was too close. And then ultimately, that's where Koeman's first free kick is pulled back for. It's the exact same thing. I also want to say that the Koeman free kick that actually goes in is entirely David Seaman's <laughs> fault. It's entirely his fault. He's almost hugging his goalpost. He's so far over. And that he, that's why he can't reach it. And the second goal was Seaman's fault as well. He's He's... He beaten in his near post from like 30 yards out, 25 yards out. It was awful goalkeeping. So I, I, I'm going to give a le- little bit of leeway to Graham Taylor for that loss because it was out of his hands. My f- so we'll get into the favourite parts of this documentary. Obviously, the best parts are all pretty much centred around Graham Taylor and Gaza as well. Uh, my favourite part and probably the, the best part of the entire documentary is the sort of five minutes... Uh, back and forth with the linesman shouting at him and then the fourth official comes and he was well ahead of his time here Graham Taylor because he's 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 uh, saying I'm one meter away I'm one meter away you know social distancing and all that 1994 that's he was ahead of his time then but then he turns to the fourth official and he says tell tell the referee he just got me the sack tell him thanks that's the best part of the documentary documentary for me Paul what what are your highlights I, uh, there's an awful lot I like, even, even as a journalist, there's a small moment when he's given a press conference in Poland and a journalist wanders up to the top table and says, can I have 10 <laughs> minutes, can I have 10 minutes? It's like, it's a throwback to, I mean, uh, we've all done press conferences before and they're, they're usually tightly regulated and there's someone you check in with, a PR person probably fields questions and as we've seen with Premier League football and the rise of Fergie not speaking to certain journalists, you know, there's an awful lot of power. But the dynamic shifts, it's almost as if, Taylor is performing for the journalists as opposed to journalists are there to, to get his stuff. It, it's such an interesting microcosm of, of football at the time. Um, I, I, I thought one of my favourite things was training session in Poland. It's just kind of the fact that these players were doing drills, then signing autographs in between, then mobbed, and then just the kind of... I thought that was a microcosm of the whole campaign, and you see just how disengaged they are in the dugout. I mean... Uh, that for me, the, the Poland away trip was when, for me, it was uh, it's, it just sort of struck me as being a bit ramshackle. The, the training pitch, Jesus, we're Irish, we're not going to get into the state of training pitches on the international front. But it, it just kind of was a, a little microcosm of of just how how ramshackle it all felt at the time for me. Colm, how good is that back and forth between Graham Taylor and the journalist just before the final game when it, where <laughs> He's telling the entire room to cheer up and stop being so negative. It was the it was, he got the laugh that he deserved from all the, <laughs> the journalists, and he could tell because at the start of that, when he's having a go, he's serious, right? But then he realizes that he's getting the crowd on his side, so he keeps him going, which is a comedy routine. But then to to credit the man that Graham Taylor uh, was uh, at the end of this uh, stand up routine that he does, and the journalist is the victim, he brings it around and says, oh, "I love him really." And, you know, again, it's just some, this is a nice little touch, so he wasn't completely victimising this one guy, you know. So I do like that. I do like that element. I also just want to give context to listeners, too, that uh, end a furiously text the WhatsApp crap group last night complaining about David Seaman for the two mistakes. <laughs> so this has been on his mind for a while, so I was waiting for him to bring it up. It was entirely I, his uh, fault. <laughs> the first goal is very harsh against Seaman. That's, no, that's it, watch no, 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 no. I'll I, tell you I, now. I I'll tell you now. Gary, Gary Neville would be having none yeah. of David Seaman if no. he was analysing that goal. Oh, he's practically he's practically left back when he's setting up the wall. Yeah. It's insane. He's literally no, the, the second one was the free kick. The first one was the ball whipped in, and uh, striker gets to it, just nips him in, and puts it against the Dutch in the front in the front post. No, this is this is no, the, the second game. No, the, 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 the Oh, yeah, I think about it. 
this is the Shakuman free kick, and then Burkamp beats him in his near post. Yeah. Oh, a bit like yeah. Ronaldo's goal against Barthez at Old Trafford, very similar to that. Anyway, I um, when we were just talking there about the Norway game, um, what I love as well about the whole documentary, one of my favourite scenes is when Nigel Clough is coming on and he's getting instructions in the disastrous Norway match. And uh, Taylor says, get warmed up there, son. Or actually sit next to me and get warmed up because I want to tell you what we want to do. And he explains in detail, Taylor, it was like, so I want you to sit behind the front two and then tell Gaza to also push over because we want to give Gaza more room <laughs> to do something. And he <laughs> goes through this and Clough is just panic, like panicked expression, glazed expression, looking ahead, being, I don't know what he wants me to do here, but I can't, you know, I'm not going to be insubordinate. So he just tries to clarify, so you want me to go left? He's like, no, no, no. I want you to go in behind the middle and then tell Gaza to just to move <laughs> behind you, but also to your left. And then he's like, go on, son, go and on. Pull the strings, and pull the strings. It's, it's exactly like Mike Passage, when he said, just run around a bit and go on a bit. <laughs> but, uh, so I do love that. Um, but I, I also, I, I found this uh, a really interesting um, story behind the scenes of, of the director, Ken McGill, and how close the pair got, uh, McGill and Taylor, because McGill and his film crew were refused entry into the stadium that night in Rotterdam, and Taylor snuck them in. So he uh, pretended they were part of the England staff, and they hid all their cameras in the physio bags, and Taylor ensured that they got their shots. And of course, they're the most famous shots, is the Rotterdam match. So that's down to Taylor. Um, subsequently, Ken McGill invited Taylor and Taylor's wife to his wedding, and Taylor went. And the wedding day was Ireland against Italy at USA 94. And at, um, as the, that match kicked off, uh, a lot of the wedding guests went into a separate TV room to watch that match. But Taylor didn't budge because he wanted to be with his wife. And Ken McGill went over and said, do you want to come in and watch the match with us? And he just looked up and in the expression that we, know, we now know from watching that documentary, he very softly said, uh, not, not this evening, son, not this evening. And he left them off. And then he came back about 15 minutes later, Ken McGill, and he said, Where, where's Taylor gone? And the wife said, oh, he couldn't resist. And he ran inside and he was watching the match and everybody else jumping up and down. But he should have been at that World Cup. And when they came to editing the footage, uh, McGill called over to the Taylor household and they were very hospitable and it was tea and cakes and all that. And they went through it and he saw Taylor was wincing, watching himself. But apparently Taylor instructed McGill to take out all the footage that made Phil Neal and Laurie McMenemy look bad. So it could have looked a lot worse because Taylor wanted it to be about him. He wanted to take the blame. Yeah. He was, it's nobody else's fault, I'm the manager. And I thought that was just an incredible insight into what the man was like. And I'll tell you what, there's still plenty of footage in that that makes Phil Neal look bad. I know, because I know. Bradley, you know if there's any character in Mike Bassett that is so spot on, it is oh my God. bloody Phil Neal. Uh, Bradley it's, Walsh is Phil Neal. I was watching the documentary. Sorry, I was watching a documentary about Barry Fry because uh, this is what YouTube throws up for me now, thanks to this podcast. And um, <laughs> Phil Neal is in as uh, Barry Fry's um, assistant manager at Peterborough, and he is exactly the same. I mean, he's dropped down <laughs> from England to Peterborough, and he's basically just mimicking the manager, berating the staff and the players. It's brilliant. Uh, like he, he genuinely just repeats everything that he's saying. It's 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 Bradley Walsh could have been that assistant manager. And he, doesn't, he doesn't even take any sessions. I mean, in the one training session we get at Wembley when Taylor's going through the crosses, he's literally like going through them, marking down the cones. I mean, what are they? I don't know what they're doing. If they're not in the training ground, that they're not in the dugout during the games. I mean, are they making the tea? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It's it's no wonder that England fans became Ireland fans for this World Cup because <laughs> it was just a disaster from the start to finish. Laz, anyway, thanks very much for coming on and doing that. We will be following up with this uh, next week for more football documentaries over the next couple of weeks. We've kind of given up on the football films because, you know, they're just, they're not the, as good as the real thing. And ultimately, that's what we're in here for. Colin Buig, Paul Moore and Karen Bradley, thanks very much. Thanks, Laz. We'll take a quick break.